Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a whole new episode of Full Seam Ahead. I'm your host, Zoe, and my partner in crime, Cantu, on the other side. How are we doing today? Good, good. Everything looking good over here. How about you? Chilling. I mean, it's the off season. We're not doing nothing too big like we talked about before. But hey, how about Halloween? That was the last time we've talked um, baseball and Halloween. I mean, how many trick-or-treaters did you get and how many times, I guess not how many times, but how many candies did you steal from your son? It was actually pretty slow. Uh, like, oh. like in the parks. Yeah, 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 it was pretty slow. We had a whole bucket left, so I, I've been mentioning on that. It's like for Halloween, it's so cool. After Halloween happens, there's a bunch of sales at like H-E-B, Kroger, because they're just trying to get all the inventory out. And I mean, it's like, what, a $2 for a whole bag of candy? Yeah. And are you one of the, like, are you one of the people that uh, puts their Christmas tree up after Halloween? No, dude. Or... Okay. So before we get to the baseball talk, I'm a firm believer on Thanksgiving. I Me feel too. like that all is right. such an underrated holiday. Like every, like you were saying, after Halloween's over. Everybody just automatically goes into Christmas mode, gets the lights out, which I mean, understandable. You want to get that out the way, hanging all the um, lights up, especially in Houston right now, which it's not cold, cold, which they did have a cold front just come in just last week. But that the temperature is not too hot, not too cold and just perfect time to put your lights up and everything like that. But Thanksgiving is such an underrated holiday. There, there's no doubt about that. I agree with you 100%. I'm, I'm a firm believer that it's, it's Halloween, Thanksgiving, then we can worry about Christmas after that. Yeah, because, I mean, after, I mean, I think Freeform, one of the channels on TV is having like a, like a, not a Halloween, a, the Christmas marathon with their movies and things like that. All right. Like, hold up. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's right now at this moment, but I know for sure later on it's going to be Christmas, but Enough talk with the holiday stuff. We'll talk about our favorite dishes when it comes to Thanksgiving time, just like how we were talking about our favorite candy for Halloween. But episode 142, the stove is warming up. That's what we're going to tell this episode because, I mean, MLB free agency is happening already. Managers on the move as well. Astros are trying to figure out what they're going to do in their search. Uh, Scott Boris, an another big guy that potential clients as in Altuve, Bregman use, uh, um, Cody Bellinger, uh, Pete Alonso is another one that they use. We'll talk about that here in a minute, but Astros Roundup, we haven't talked about that here. Continuation of the Astros managerial search, Astros free agency. What are the Astros looking to bring in, Angel? I mean, there's a lot of to bring in, relievers, starters, uh, outfielding depth. You, you don't know. And then I think the talk of what's been on social media yesterday on Wednesday, as we're recording this on a Wednesday night, if you're listening to this, this is Thursday morning. Jordan Alvarez, speculation, a picture that he put on his Instagram story. I think a lot of people are talking about that. We'll give our thoughts on that here in a minute. And then what's the stove cooking in the offseason? Instead of saying around the league, because obviously around the league is talking about everybody from National League to American League, it's the offseason. So the hot stove is going to be cooking, especially with the baseball winter meetings coming soon in December. But, Angel, let's start off with our Astros roundup. Shout out. We haven't had a shout out since I think I believe the ALCS. Mauricio Dubon appreciation. Like How it. about this guy being nominated for two go gloves at second base and at the utility position? Uh he he did come short not winning it at second base, but he did win the utility glo gold glove for the American League presented by Rawlings Baseball. Became the first Honduran born player to win the award, first AL player ever, ever to be nominated for two go gloves at second base and at the utility position. Angel, I mean, the man has done it all. World Series winner, uh, first Honduran to do a lot of things, playoffs, postseason, things like that. Tell us why this guy is so special and what does his future look like for him in the Astros uniform? Because his contract, I believe, might be ending soon, if not mistaken, two more years what he's been to this group of guys in this clubhouse, especially. Well, let's start with that first part of the question of why is he so special? Well, honestly, he's the pride of Honduras. In baseball, again, he's only the second Honduran to ever play in the major league, the first to win a World Series. So that's that's huge. That's just another we've talked about before how the how baseball has gotten more ultra more diverse, and that's just adding to the diversity that 
there is that there is you know we see a lot of Dominican players you see a lot of Mexican players Puerto Ricans but now maybe with Mauricio Dubon in a few years we start seeing the next players come from Honduras or Central America and that sort so it's very special I think he's well loved in Honduras and I'm sure every time he goes back he gets celebrated because that's he, he, like he just means that much to that country over there and the second part what does his future look like in an national uniform well I, I I could see that Marlon Gonzalez role, like unless he starts struggling like Marlon did in his later years with the Astros. I mean, I don't see why he I mean, he can't be an Astro for the long run. I mean, he can play every position, even first base, center field, yeah. every position they offer. Like he's very crucial to this team to give people days off and you know an injury. He's always there to step up and and this winning the Gold Glove as utility just shows how special he is because no matter where you plug him in in the field you know he's going to give you that high quality defense yeah i mean the, like you were saying oh go ahead go ahead and i'm just saying and with the bat as well he had a 20 like a 20 game history earlier in the year too yeah. a lot i feel like a lot of people forget that because that was in the beginning part of the season but what he has done defensively wise like you're saying the dude played first base maybe what two or three games but still, I mean, played almost every position you could think of besides the catching role and obviously pitching. Um, testimony, what he's done for, I feel like he could be a trailblazer for the Honduran com uh, community over there because Honduras is not really big on baseball. It's, it's mainly for soccer, I'd say. But after Dubon having so much success, even the other player before Dubon, um, obviously Dubon's the second Honduran player, to come out of Honduras, but even that first guy, he, he was in the Astros uniform before. I don't know the his name by, you know, in my head, but uh, I, I feel like he's just trailblazing the way for the community of Honduras. But real quick, I had to, to look at his, uh, his contract because I wasn't a hundred percent sure he's dealing with arbitration until 2026 and then 27, he will be a free agent at the age of 32. So Dubon's going to have a lot of years in Houston unless a trade happens, which I highly doubt that's going to happen. But just a testimony like you were talking about, the years that Astros have had utility players, and I feel like the Astros were that type of team to establish a utility role for like Marvin Gonzalez, Ledmus Diaz. Now you have uh, Mauricio Dubon. Now you're seeing a lot of teams do that, especially like uh, I know the number one team doing that is the, the Cardinals. You got Tommy Edmond. You got Brandon Donovan over there. Um, ju just – being able to not solidify your role as in one position or a two position player like Dubon, he's just said, you know what, plug me anywhere that you need me. He even shouted out Omar Lopez, Joe Espada, because them are the two guys that are your infield uh, defensive coaches. But we had to give him a shout out because he's done a fascinating job in an Astros uniform ever since that trade from the San Francisco Giants. And that was managed by Mr. James Click himself, which, shockingly, James Click hasn't found a job yet. Yet. Because I, I feel like it will be coming soon, but I, I feel like until James Click feels like that's the time, it will be his time. I agree. And unless you've been living under a rock for, for the past few weeks, you, you, <laughs> you know the Astros are looking for new managers since Jesse Baker retired after the ALCS, but the Astros B-Rise has been busy trying to trying to get uh give us give the Astros fans and just the media in general all this information about what's going on with the Astros managerial process. And starting on Tuesday, November 7th, per Brian McTaggart, uh, he says that the club has started to interview potential managerial candidates, including bench coach Joe Espada. And according to Jim Crane, Astros owner Jim Crane has made it clear in the in the task of finding a new manager belongs to Brown. And this is from Donna Brown himself. We've gone through a lot of names and a lot of names I know very well. And it's kind of been like the debate that I've seen around is that who's really going to have the last say? Is it Jim Crane or Donna Brown, right? Mm -hmm. It is Donna Brown's job to find a manager, but obviously Jim Crane has to approve it. But I feel like Donna Brown will know what he's talking about. So that's why he was hired for that position. You know, that's who Jim Crane trusts, so I, I feel like he'll be able to trust Dan Brown and picking a great manager. But going back to what Dan Brown said at, at the very end, 
where he said, we've gone through a lot of names and a lot of names I know very well. If you had to take a guess, Lorenzo, who would they be? Who would those names be? Hmm. I mean, I would say Atlanta first off, because that's where he just came from. So you're looking at Weiss, the the Braves bench coach. You're looking at Eric Young Sr., the Ash, uh, not the Astros, the Braves first base coach, and then even Ron Washington, which, well, we'll talk about him finding yeah. a new spot uh, later on the show. But I would say them three for sure. And then obviously Joe Espada being the number one guy um, to – be able to uh, interview for the for the coach position, which his contract did expire, so he could be open to any other openings. As of right now, the Astros are one team, Padres are the other, and then the Brewers are another. So there's three vacant managerial spots open, and Joe Spada could go anywhere. But as of right now, um, what they said, it's uh, it looks like Dana Brown has interviewed one guy only, and it's been Joe Spottis so far, as it looks. Yeah, I mean, I feel like he's easier when to get to since you know he is part of the Astros organization. But we like, there's been some more news that yeah, we talked about Ron, Ron Washington and Gabe Kepler and uh, you know Eric Eric and Senior, not like in the last past podcast of potential man managerial candidates but there's been some people who've been under the radar who have come into light like this is per john morosi ray montgomery is a candidate to, wa- to watch in the astros managerial search houston general manager Dana brown told me today that he's a big fan of montgomery a contemporary a contemporary of brown and jeff agua from northeast baseball circles in the late 1980s and i'm gonna be honest with you i did not know who ray montgomery was before <laughs> this so you know it was it was pretty crazy to see like it's just like they're doing an extensive search an extensive search like like you're about to find out about guys you didn't have no clue where even candidates are going to be coming to that as well mm-hmm. and this is very this is a very enticing job too because when you have a squad like the astros i'm sure everyone wants to be part of that so it's gonna be a, a long process but more on montgomery is he played for the Astros in 1996 to 1998 and was teammates with Bagwell. So there, so there goes that connection there. Mm-hmm. And right now he is the Astros bench coach as of right now. And Angels bench coach. Angels. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. That's what I meant to say. But uh, like another Astros uh, coach is ben, uh, Benji Gill, too. He, and like, like he's looking for a manager spot, too. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if his, his name was bounced around, too. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised either. Uh, the interesting part with this Ray Montgomery is, like you said, I mean, I've never personally, I've never heard of him. Um, if you look at the back of his baseball card, he only played with one team. That was the Astros. Oh, wow. and it was 96 to 98. Uh, obviously, too, being teammates with Jeff Bagwell, there's ties right there. And like in the quote that John Morosi had tweeted out on X or Twitter, if you'd like to call it, he has ties with Northeast baseball circles in the late 1980s. Dana Brown came from Seton Hall. Um, Ray Montgomery came from Fordham, which Fordham University is right there in New York. And then obviously Jeff Bagwell went to Hartford, I believe the college is called. So that's up Northeast as well. So yeah, like it's a Northeast ties right there. Um, but it, but it's, it's just you know, nothing bashing against Montgomery. I'm pretty sure he is a great candidate for the coaching job, but I would be looking to another direction. If the angels with Phil Nevin, Joe Madden era, which he's, he was there at that time. Why hasn't him like him himself, Montgomery himself been connected to the, you know, interview process for the angels as of now too. Do you think this is more like, Bagwell trying to, you know, he was crucial. He was detrimental for the Jose Abreu signing and um mm-hmm. and more Af- and other free uh signings. Oh, the Rafael Montero one also that's the Rafael Montero signing as well. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's just like Jeff Bagwell giving his input here and there, you know, with these guys that he likes and could be potential for the next manager? I, I mean hundred percent. Because if you remember, I think either this podcast or the last podcast we had, Jim Crane had said that Jeff Bagwell was going to be in these, you know, in these discussion discussions about the next Astros manager. Dana Brown's going to have a saying, but Jim Crane and Bagwell are kind of going to be close and close 
to figuring out who's going to be the next one. Remember, too, Bagwell was a big part of having Dusty Baker come as the next manager with the whole, um, you know, cheating scandal that had popped up. Who, who was going to take over that job? And I mean, to me, that was a great one. I think Jose Abreu still, I, I, I'm a still firm believer that Jose Abreu is going to do a good job in these next two years that the Astros have him. So I, I think it's not a bad suggestion. But for me, it's just like I feel like there are more qualified, more better guys out there to, you know, go for this interview process instead of a guy like Ray Montgomery. I don't know if he has interviewed for the job, but at the same time, too, I, I feel like, well, the Angels had a connection right there. Why not have him have the chance to interview for that position instead of Ron Washington? So I, I think to me. Nothing against him. No, I'm pretty sure he's a great coach. But to me, this is all back to Jeff Bagwell. And like I said, Bagwell's going to be a – I mean, he's an Astros Hall of Famer. He's in Cooperstown with a plaque over there. He is not a bad guy to go to, but his input process, a lot of input on, you know, which Dana Brown, this is his first time being able to look for a manager. I, I just feel a little I, – I feel like it's a sticky situation for me. I can see that, but I don't know. Like if things were done, like like if these if things will get done correctly, I think Donna Brown will be play more of like his role, right, in finding this. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think he'll be a big role. Uh, like I said, there's nothing against a Bagwell. It's just with the Osmus talks and all that other stuff. I mean, that that's just a big part of it uh, when it comes to these things. So. We'll just have to see. Keep a radar on that. Of course, like I said, Padres, Brewers, and the Astros are the only teams without a manager. Uh, let's move on to the Astros with their contracts and then the free agency, what they're looking for. Uh, per Chandler Rome, obviously, like you were saying, the beat writers are working out there. Chandler Rome works for the Athletic as the Astros beat writer. He had mentioned the team is open to adding a starter, starting pitcher. Outfield help is not a priority. And then, you know, obviously with the winter meetings, Astros don't have, you know, the, the, you know, over the threshold, I would say for the tax uh, luxury and things like that, just to go over, but they will find a way they will find a way if they got to spin Jim Crane, apparently isn't afraid to spin. And this is what Dana Brown had to say on the financial flexibility for, you know, for the baseball winter meetings. He says, I think Jim will do whatever it takes to win. And if it means that we have to spend a little more, he will do it. First, what do you think about the Astros adding a starter and obviously the outfield uh, not being a huge priority? And then second, Angel, what do you think about that? Astros, are you think Jim Crane is willing to spend a little bit more than he wants to? What do you think? So I fully agree that the Astros should add a starter. I think this season was just like, well, look what happened this season, right? Mm -hmm. he, he, I think what the Astros learned is that you can never have too much pitching, especially because unsuspected injuries can happen. Like Garcia, McCutters, right? And then we, Akiti as well was gone was gone for most of the season as well. So I think that's one thing the Astros learned is that they, you can never have too much pitching to step up. But I think that's why they had to pay a big price for Justin Verlander because that was their weak spot, right? That was their weakness mm -hmm. uh, throughout the season. So I think that is. I'm I'm glad they're looking into it because I think that is a wonderful opportunity for the Astros to get stronger is in their pitching. That yeah, you had JP France step up, you had Hunter Brown step up too, but I mean, they were taxed by the end. So yeah, and and you never know what could happen as you saw, right? And I don't know. I think this is my only criticism for Jim Crane is yes, he says that he likes to spend, but when it comes to signing these contracts, there's teams that spend way more, like. Yeah. And it, 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 like, and it's just him not wanting to go into double digit contract, like double digit year contracts or eight, yeah. nine year contracts. Which I mean, I don't blame him because you see contracts like Miguel Cabrera's contract, Albert Pujols' contract. Yeah. yeah, that's a big They're, one. Yeah, like or even Yelich, Bo like, <laughs> Bobby Bonilla, real quick. Yeah. Shout out to him. <laughs> so, I mean, I get the worry, I get the hesitation to do it, but you gotta like, I feel like you gotta read the market though, like. Mm -hmm. Otani is about to get big money, like, like Huge. the like, like, like it's a player's market right now, and you know, I feel like I'm not saying he's trying to shortchange the players. Like, I'm just saying that sometimes you do gotta 
you know, spend a little bit more. So I agree with him in that point. But sometimes you got to pay your guys too. I think, like, because I don't know, like, well, like if you're Kyle Tucker, how would you feel if Jim Crane gives this eight eight years something something million dollar contract to this n- new signing, but yet you're over there in our in arbitration and going back and forth mm-hmm. because they don't. So it's just like. I don't know. Like, it, like if you're gonna spend, spend big, but spend it like on whoever's gonna, whoever's gonna help you win this game, and that includes the, the the guys who are in already on the roster. Yeah, and I mean, there there's been history on that. Like you're saying, uh, George Springer, a fan favorite, gone. Um, I think if you're looking back on it about not giving him a contract, that's worth you know, like you were saying, maybe to like a seven year, eight year contract. It looks pretty promising because. Georgie Boy over there in Toronto hasn't done what he done in Houston. Carlos Correa, on the other hand, as well, which another fan favorite, I'd say an Astros team captain from the years in his tenure in Houston. Uh, have you seen how that's gone? Look at teams don't even want to sign him because of the fact of his uh, injury history. So I completely agree. But at the same time, too, you do have the spin for these guys. Just think about, I always go back and think about last year's off season with Corbin Burns and his displeasure of the arbitration casing with the Brewers and how that evolved. He, he, he told everybody, he told the media, he was, he just didn't like the taste coming out of that room with the Brewers and saying, well, look, this is why we didn't go with you. This is why we're not giving you this money because look at the way you perform at the end. And if you're looking at Kyle Tucker now, think about, and even for Amber Valdez, you could say too, think about the regular season. They did a fascinating job Two, I mean, both of them were back-to-back all-stars in 22 and 23, but in the postseason for this year, specifically for Amber Valdez, wasn't as sharp as he, as he was in 22 in the postseason. And then you look at back Kyle Tucker had to be like the number one X factor in the postseason. Uh, especially I'd say in the ALCS for the reason why the Astros couldn't win one game at home from them from, um, you know, from their four games at Minute Maid Park. So it, it's huge, but at the same time too, you do have to spin in order to get the best out of your players, I'd say. So just, just another thing with Jim Crane and his, you know, his big signings. I'm pretty sure, though, we will see Kyle Tucker get an And this is my opinion. I think we'll see him get an extension. I'd say a seven year. I will. I would say that because I remember Dana Brown uh, when he was hired. He had told Crane, you know, hey, well, let's get get comfortable with some of these decisions I'm going to be coming up with, and you know, with the ideas and the makings I'm going to be doing. So I wouldn't be surprised if Kyle Tucker does get a seven year maybe eight year deal in the Astros uniform. Oh yeah. I can see that too. So moving on to the free agency part, let's talk about some Astros players that are under contract right now. And really two of them being at the end of their contract after the 24 season. And then being the number one guy, is going to be Scott Boris. Scott Boris is the number one agent players go for um, trying to get their contracts in order and things like that. But let's start off with Lance McCullers jr. Scott Boris had to say this on his client of LMJ. He says, certainly going to be pitching next year, no doubt. If you remember, McCullers did have a surgery on, I believe, a little bone in his elbow. Not 100% sure, but I believe so. Um, But Scott Boris didn't provide any specific timeline for when he would come back. Dana Brown said that it could be early of July, and this was per Chandler Rome on that part as well, which it would be nice to see Lance McCullers be healthy for one season because this dude has electric stuff. But as we've talked about in the past episodes, he has not pitched one season, one full 162 game season healthy. Something has always set him back. Um, You know, it's unfortunate because this guy, like I said, when he's healthy, I think he has one of the most electric stuff, electric arsenals, I'd say, in the game. I mean, 21, that that was a fine example what he did. He put the team on his back when Justin Verlander was out. He was really the team ace, I'd say. Took him all the way to the ALCS, to the World Series. Obviously, he didn't pitch in that year. But with a healthy Lance McCullers Jr., he he could give you some depth 
and some and you you know being one of the best in the game i'd say no oh, yeah it'll be it'll be interesting to see him back in the astros uniform and i think astros fans can't wait to see him pitching astros uniform i think he's like he's well loved the organization with the fans you know he's always repping houston as well so that'll be good to see also don't be surprised and this is another opinion and prediction of mine don't be surprised if he gets traded I won't. I think he will. I think he will. But we'll, we'll just have to see because obviously his injury history. I don't know if teams want to go after that. But moving on to two clients that are under contract for this last part of the year of 2024, which we haven't even got to. But Scott Boris had to say this about Altuve and Bregman. He said the Astros have expressed a desire to extend Altuve and Alex Bregman, but there have been no discussions yet. Angel, I mean. I think every Astros fan wants to see Jose and Altuve, and I'd even say Alex Bregman in an Astros uniform for the rest of their career. Do you see it happening before spring training or before the 24 season? I would say that before the 24 season. I mean, yes, the offseason is like like it's a long period of time, so I'm sure some discussions will creep in here and there, but maybe after the next season. I think so, too. I feel like Altuve... I feel yeah, I say Altuve is going to be the number one priority, and yeah, then Alex Bregman. Nothing, I agree with against, that. nothing against Bregman, but when you got a guy like Altuve, um, that's been with this team since bad times and now to the good times, I feel like they're going to do whatever they can, just like how they did with Craig Biggio in his years in Houston. So, just have to see what happens in there. Of course, Scott Boris is an, a, a, a really a tough agent, but he's always been great to really i mean his uh, connection with jim crane and the Astros hasn't been phenomenal as he would say but I, I think moving on to the next part of Astros roundup jordan alvarez alvarez i mean he, he's been out and about i don't know if you saw him in a in a in a halloween costume i don't know if you saw that he was yeah, out okay. there trick-or-treating and then obviously we talked about two in our last one of him being at the Dynamo game, which I won't be surprised if he'll be there for game three. It's a do or die for the Houston Dynamo as they take on Real Salt Lake for uh, to move on into the MLS Cup. But the thing of talking about uh, from everybody right now, the picture that he posted on Instagram, on his Instagram story, he shared a pic of him and Luis Robert Jr. back in their younger days. If you had to take a guess, if you had to take a guess, what age did you see? I mean, how do you think they were at that picture? Because Jordan Alvarez looks like he was rocking a stash at that time. I was about to say that, yeah. I mean, it looks like two young 20-year-olds having a good time. I think they were even wearing – to me, it looked like they were wearing soccer jerseys. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure they're probably like 15, 16. Yeah. And that's crazy because Jordan Alvarez is growing a stash at that time, which I mean, a lot of people do. It's crazy, but I mean, overall, I, I, I got to ask you this: What does this mean? I mean, because Jordan Alvarez, if you remember, I mean, they're they're great buddies from the All Star game in Seattle, um, all the way to times in in Cuba as well. What is he trying to tell us, Angel? Is he trying to reel Luis Robert Jr. into an Astros uniform and join the other Cubans that the Astros have had in their years from Yuli Gurriel to now Jose Abreu, Jordan Alvarez, or is it just two Cubanos rem reminiscing back in the days of uh, being back in Cuba or wherever that picture was taken? I'm going to go with the two Cubans is reminiscing back in the younger days. I don't think there's much to it. I think maybe I'm sure they've been talking in the offseason. Like you said, they are friends. So I'm sure they haven't lost contact, but could be. I mean, the White Sox aren't exactly in a great state right now, and the Astros are looking to add maybe an outfielder. So, I mean, it's there, right? The criteria is there for both clubs. But I feel like in order for the Astros to attain Reese Robert, you know, they have to give up an arm and a leg for that. So, um, I mean, maybe that's what the players want. You know, maybe they want to play with each other, but I don't know. Maybe it's just like um, – I'll have to see a little bit more. So uh, I'll just play it by day and see what comes up out of it. But as of right now, I think it's just, I think it's just noise. It's just noise. Yeah. I mean, we, we had to take it to the X. Um, I mean, we had to tell everybody, I mean, what, what is everybody's thinking process of seeing that picture and like, kind of like, what is he trying to tell us? Obviously he put two emojis, excuse me, tagging 
Luis Robert Jr. as well. Is Jordan Alvarez trying to tell something that we don't know? I mean, obviously, not a lot of people know what's going to happen, but uh, I mean, like you're saying, it'd have to be an arm in the leg. Um, I know right now the White Sox are needing of a shortstop. The Astros just drafted a shortstop, which he could develop into a second baseman later in the years or a third baseman like Alex Bregman. But I don't think Tim Anderson's going back to the south side of Chicago. There's a, you know, a small little chance, small window, I'd say, which you could be kicking the tires of trying to add Dylan Stees, add Luis Robert Jr., or add one of them. But Bryce Matthews, like you were saying, they're going to have to give up an arm and a leg, and I would see Bryce Matthews being the number one guy. And some of the Astros pitching as of right now, like I said, Nas McCullers Jr., Jose Arquiti, J.P. France could be in some of these talks, even Hunter Brown, I would say. So just, just a tab to keep on because it, it'll look real. It, just imagine an outfield and a lineup how it would be with Luis Robert in that lineup. I mean, Center, and- Go ahead. Sorry. Center, you patrol Robert Jr. Left. I mean, you could put some Chazzy Fizz and and uh, Jordan Alvarez. And then right field, you got Kyle Tucker. Yeah. And Ooh, Astros fans have experienced the loose Robert effect. I feel like every time he comes to the Mary Park, he's making acrobat catches on the wall, you know, diving out. So, I mean, Astros are familiar with the work that Luis Robert puts on the field. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting what they're going to do. Uh, John Morosi, too, real quick before we move on to our next little segment of Astros Roundup. He had said at MLB GM meetings, a trend, a trend to watch. He said, team execs tell me trade conversations for position players are more serious now than at this time last year. One reason, Angel. Quote, buying, end quote, clubs have more interest in players under club control than those available in free agency. It's starting to be a trend, which Dylan C still has some club control, and obviously Luis Robert Jr. still has some club control. Yeah. What is he trying to what is Morosi trying to tell us that we don't know? I mean, like you said, Luis Robert Jr., as soon as he steps into that box at Minute Maid Park, a lot of people are like, oh, th- this guy's gonna do some damage. Gold Glove winner, Silver Slugger finalist, um, home run derby participant. This guy could look good in Nationals uniform, I'd say. I agree with you. But last but not least of our Astros roundup, the Astros have been, you know, kicking the tires of trying to start an entertainment center. A Texas Live, a battery over there in Atlanta, um, as well as in Philly, St. Louis. The Astros have finally said something about the process of doing something about this, and it is set to break ground in 2024. 2024, uh, Jim Crane has decided to build an entertainment center for the fans. Obviously, Astros fans, but I'd say even more than Astros fans in the downtown area of of Houston, just being overall an an entertainment center. Um, But what what do you think about that? I mean, I think it'll be great for the city of Houston, It'll be great for Astros fans. It'll be even better for Jim Crane, I'd say. Um, I mean, what what's your thoughts about that? Oh, I agree with you. I think it'll be a really nice touch to add to Minary Park. Like, like you've seen those ballparks that have those inter- like entertainment centers. Like it's just a different vibe. People are having a good time. You know, I like I'm not opposed to it. I think it's a great idea. I'm just wondering the logistics side of it because because uh Minary Park is already horrendous in parking situation and you know, oh, man. getting you by, lying. getting by and stuff like that. And they're using a parking lot in order to build this entertainment center. So I don't know. I wonder how it's going to work out with that. But I mean, I'm not opposed to it. It's a great idea. It has said in this article, because I was looking for the article when uh, I was talking about it. It says lots of theme bars and restaurants, space to hang, which obviously if you've gone to Texas Live, I know I've been, I don't know if you've have been Angel, but I mean, they have a bunch of restaurants in there. A great place, I'd say, to hang out, you know, before you go to the ballpark, uh, things like that. Even a four-star hotel. Not bad. Texas Light has that, I know for sure. But uh, real quick on the article, Giles Kibbe, the Asheville Senior Vice President and General Counsel, touted this two-anchor complex on a block abounded by Avienda de las Americas 
Capitol Street, Hamilton Street, and Texas Avenue with 60,000 square feet of retail. That's the space you were talking about, that parking space. Uh, and dining space and a 17-story, 300-room hotel as a crucial piece in the evolution of the 51-year-old franchise. And I've even heard about um, being a TV outside of the entertainment center, which I'm, I'm not opposed to it, but you got to think about this. This is Texas. This is Houston, Texas. We're talking about triple-digit heat waves that the uh, – not the Ashos. The city has been uh, involved in this last uh, summer. So I would have loved to seen that indoors, but same time too. I I believe it's gonna be right there. Do you remember where Home Play Bar and Grill used to be? Right yeah. there on the I don't know. I think it's Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Texas Street right there. That's where they're planning to put it to. But that that's a I'd say it's a small little area. I think it'd be a little bigger than Texas Live, but it's I feel like it's a little small. I feel like it could add another anchor i guess you could say to the entertainment center but uh, but like you said i'm i'm all in for it i'm all in for this thing no yeah i'd be in it like it'd be crazy to see seeing break ground you know getting built from the ground up and i think it's great for the ashes i mean they're gonna need that money to pay some players so and i guess i always get to you know when you yeah. can get some more income in their pockets i guess but i know we haven't done this segment in a while i think since the beginning of the season yeah, around I mean, well, we, we talked about it around the league in the beginning of the yeah. season. Yeah. yeah, it's been a while, but, you know, it's free agency. So, you know, like the episodes car, the stove is warming up and it has. And there's been a bunch of moves and there's plenty of teams that needed managers and, you know, people trying to reinforce their squads. But let's start with the managers. Steven Vogt. I don't know. That name sounds familiar. Oh. Yeah, he's Hall of Famer. Yeah, longtime athletic. I'm sure the Astros have seen a lot of him. Is now the new, the new manager for the Cleveland Guardians. Now, I, to me, honestly, I think that was a great setting. Usually, they just like AJ Hinch catchers make pretty good managers. Like there's like mm -hmm. there's some exceptions as well, right? But I'm sure like he's brings so much energy to the clubhouse, not just as a player, but I'm sure as a manager he would do the same way. And you know, he, like he's a voice that the players can get along with and like are like easy to follow. Like I feel like. Stephen Vogt will bring a, a great presence, especially to those young guys. Like he knows the game, knows what he's mm -hmm. talking about, and he's been there, done it as well. So I think that's a great signing. Definitely a great mentor, I say too. Oh yeah. I oh, and then it. speaking real, real quick, when, before you get into the next one, you said catchers are great managers. Um, you know, you're knocking on the doors for Brad Osmus, I see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I did say there were some exceptions. So. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> a little exception. <laughs> um. Carlos Mendoza, and I, like he is the new, he is going to be the new manager for the New York Mets. Prior to that, he was the new president of baseball operations for David Stearns and the Mets, and they will not be hiring a general manager at this time as well. I think I, interesting. Yeah, so I don't know what's going on over there in New York, but I think that's a great signing for them as well. You know, like I think Major League does need a little bit more. Uh, Latino managers to because there's been influence yeah. of Latino players, so being able to communicate, you know, that language barrier is not an issue over there. So especially you have Francisco Lindor and um, hang on, also like, Big Me Pete uh, Alvarez to that. No, no, no like, oh, the, oh, you're talking about the yeah. Latino players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Francisco yeah. Alvarez, and you have like Edwin Diaz. Of, Edwin Diaz. There you go. So you know, I, I feel that's a great signing. Being being a bilingual manager goes a long way. You know, just the comfort level for the players and all that good stuff. You know, and we saw a little bit. In the, we saw that a little bit. In Dusty Baker, how yeah, he was not fluent in Spanish, but he tried when he's talked to his players. And, you know, even the media. Yeah. So. But yeah, maybe real quick, four Latinos in this managers as of right now. Now Mendoza being five, you got Olivia. Olivia. <laughs> uh, is it Olive or Olivio? Yeah, Olivia Marmo, Davey Martinez. Uh, Pedro Griffo from the White Sox, White Sox. and uh, I know I'm missing one. There's one out there, but I can't think of it right now at this moment. Uh, David Martinez now with the National Alex League? Cora. There it is. Alex Cora, it. Yeah. Alex Cora for the Red Sox. So, yeah, like you said, being able to have that language, um, you know, being bilingual, being with the players, and then just like you're with Stephen Vogue being a young guy over there with the Guardians, and I think that was a great hire too. 
I, I think it'd be a good little hire for the Mets. Um, unless you're Frank the Tank from Barstool, I think he went on a little rant about <laughs> hiring that guy from 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 the Yankees. So, right. but I, I think personally, I, I agree with you. I think it's a good it's a good fit. And then there's drama and the NL Central. <laughs> yeah, big big drama from Chicago to Milwaukee. You know, it's not too far along. Bitter rivals. Well. Cubs just swat, just kidnapped their manager wow. and made them sign an eight million dollar contract. You know, with you know at gunpoint because I'm sure Craig Council really didn't think gunpoint. twice about that one. Because <laughs> Cubs hired Craig Council to become the next manager. What a move! And, it, and it's crazy because you know David Ross, who was in the Cubs uniform for quite a while as well, was their own manager. And they just ransacked him out of there. You know, but. Great signing for the Cubs leaves leaves a better taste for Milwaukee. Like, um, if I do recall saying the president or the owner, president, either one of those, I forgot um, what his title was. Stearns. Uh, was it Stearns? Yeah, yeah. Um, he said yeah. that you know. Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. He was. I was just saying. Uh, I was president of baseball operations. Uh, that he was saying that yeah, the Cubs got a great council, but that no, like the you know they lost the manager, but that that relationship he built with the Milwaukee Brewers that's it's gone you know especially signing with their division rivals it's just that was a crazy high dude like I I was blindsided I I I mean I immediately texted you when that happened I was like how does Craig Council and a Wisconsin native um he played with the Brewers too through his days and he managed for the Brewers for I believe six or seven years and I'm pretty sure New York was very firm that they were going to get him as the new Mets manager just because David Stern's moved to, um, you know, with with Cohen over there in New York. And, you know, hold my can, hold my soda, my whatever you want to call it. Craig Council just got swept up by the Cubs. And that drive is just a two-hour drive. So the, the fans hate each other. And then as soon as the news happened, the city of Milwaukee just went down. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you had um, radio hosts. I told you there was a radio host that had its frame Craig Council jersey that was autographed. He took it with him. I don't know what he did with it, but he took it with him off the wall. Um, and then even his own park yeah, in I his old that. childhood park had graffiti that was named after it. him. Yeah, graffiti was off of him, off of him, uh, on the sign of where it says Craig Council Park. Um, that, that's just crazy. I would feel the same way as with, you know, the, as the Milwaukee fans, but at the same time, too, you have to have that kind of gratitude for the years that Council had came in and brought postseason baseball to the city of Milwaukee, I'd say, too. Yeah, I don't know. $8, eight million dollar talks, you know. It's hey, I just remember when that first game comes in Milwaukee, I'm I'm really intrigued to see what the reactions are going to be. Is it going to be boo birds or is it going to be a little mix of everything? It might be a little mix of everything, but I, I feel like at the beginning, a, a, a lot of boo birds will be flying high in that in that stadium for sure. Yeah, definitely. And then a the guy we talked about as a potential and. Um, manager for the Astros, and he was even interested in it. You know, it's a great job. You know, Ron Washington. Yeah. He's been sweeped up by the Los Angeles Angels, which I think was a good move for them. Veteran presence. I, I don't know if you ever seen those videos of Ron Washington teaching the fundamentals. Yes. Uh, to the infield, and it's just a great watch. You know, a minute though, video, and you could just watch it like. Oh that yeah, thing. on repeat sometimes. You know, it's just they, just so much knowledge he has for the game. Mm-hmm. You know very detail oriented and I think that's what the angels need. I think the angels need some stability, some grounding for that ball club, you know, because they might lose Otani. So and they have and they've had Mike Trout for a while now and they can't get anything done. So they need a lot of reinforcements. I think Ron Washington will be is a great man for that. With that signing, there's only three manager managerial jobs are open and that is the Astros, Brewers and Padres. So you know so time's ticking. Which well, which team you think will have the next manager? But uh, like well, out of those three, which which team will first will be the first one to sign a new manager? 
I say the Padres. I think the Padres are nearing because they've already interviewed, uh, like you mentioned before, a guy named Benji Gill. Um, who I, I, they've and they've interviewed a bunch of candidates, but obviously, uh, I think they'll be the next one. And then even that one too. <laughs> Bob Melvin said, "Hey, I, I'm leaving from San Diego. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to the Bay Area." That that one's even more crazier as well. So, um. But yeah, I, I think the Padres I'd say would be next because Brewers just got blindsided, and I feel like Dana Brown and the Astros are just taking you know its time until it, I, I'd say they'll get something done before December because the winter meetings are the first to second week of December. Okay, so and lots lots of moving pieces, lots of moving parts for this uh, free agency, and it doesn't just start with the managers; it also starts with free agency for the players and. A lot of players declined the qualifying offer, which is expected. You know, the uh, this is yeah. what the Astros do, just uh, kind of like as a courtesy. You know, hey, we want you back for this, but you know, this is like so they can get that little draft pick as well, like the, the compensation as well. That's yeah. So the the players who have declined the qualifying offer, so Otani, of course, Cody Bellinger, Josh Hader, Blake Snell, Aaron Nola, Sonny Gray, Matt Chapman. But there's also been some some free agents that did not receive a qualifying offer. And that's Rice Hoskins, Mike Clevenger, Tasco Hernandez, Kane Kershaw, J.D. Martinez, and Jorge Soler. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of big names there. Like Rice Hopkins, oh, wow. I know the Phillies are done with him, I think, because they just announced that Bryce Harper will be their everyday first baseman moving forward. So, yeah, you know, Sohil Tani is going to be the hottest uh, free agent on the block. And, you know, we just talked about the Cubs. What? You know, getting credit counts today. The Cubs are appear to be the strongest suitor at the moment for Shohei Otani. I mean, they might lose. That, you think the Cubs? That, that's what was announced. The Cubs are. Wow. Yeah. I feel like the obviously the Dodgers would be the number one. Can you imagine Otani to the Cubs. When I saw that, I was just like, man, that's fine. Go to the NL. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, because Alvarez and Tucker and, uh, you know, all these other guys not being able to get the MVP. I mean, think about it. Yeah. It's a blessing, I think, for the AL. Oh, yeah, but, I mean, Cubs are making moves. I mean, they, they won another championships. You know, there was a long drop before 2016, and you got Craig Counselor. I mean, they were like what surprised me is that they were competitive and they were able mm-hmm. to turn around Marcus Stroman, they were able to turn around Cody Bellinger, you know, and I'm sure they can turn around some other guys that are um are there and even um what's his name? Not Ian Happ, the one that plays second base. Nico Horner. Cup. Nico Horner, he I mean he's been stepping up pretty good as well. So go glove yeah. guy now too. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean the Cubs are making moves and I mean they already got I mean, they already have the foundation. George, they still had a great out of a pitching performance, you know, throughout the whole season. So, I mean, they got the foundation built. They're just trying to finish off by adding those pieces. But, yeah, I could see them making some moves this offseason. And I might butcher this name, but Yoshinobu. <laughs> give, it, Yam- give it. Come on, give it to me. Give it to me. Yo- Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Hey, that, that was pretty good. What that it? was pretty good. Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Yamamoto. There you go. He, well, he's he on every job. Yeah. Job. He, he's on everyone's radar. He pitched a complete game in his last start of the season in Japan. He threw 138 pitches and 14 strikeouts. 138? Yeah. So he, yeah, that was, I mean, he, he has 138 less in the tank, but I know he has a lot more when that came from in the States. And I mean, you saw how pitches from Japan come in right away. You Darvish and Kodai Senga, I mean, at first he was a little wow. shaky, but, I mean, he's, what, rookie of the year can't, uh, finalist as well. So mm-hmm. I feel like they don't miss a beat, uh, like, when they, co- when they come from the States. So I'll be interested to see as well who he signs with. Dude, 138 pitches. You don't even see that. In I don't know if he throw nine innings in that game, which I'm pretty sure. Oh, a complete game, obviously, yeah. yeah. Um, you don't see that in pitchers now. That's, like, more the late. Not even late nineties. I'd say early nineties, late eighties. That you used to have guys throw over a hundred pitches in like eight inning, nine inning ball games. You you hardly see that now. Which that that, that is a strength to that uh, Japanese player Yamamoto. Oh yeah, 
And then the Dodgers have expressed interest in Teosco Hernandez. So, like, he was one Pretty of the ones one. that... Yeah, he, he was the one of the ones that declined his qualifying offer. Now he's looking to sign. That's so interested in Eduardo Rodriguez. I know earlier in the season they were trying to, you know, trade for him. He told him no. Uh, but Eduardo Rodriguez has stated there is no geography, like geography, 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 basically. I yeah, know what like, you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. I can't even think of it myself. He doesn't care where, like he doesn't care where he goes. You know what? He right? don't care and if then, he's in the east, he's in the west, he's yeah, in the go. central. <laughs> there you go. I mean, yeah, I was, a, I, I can believe I butchered that one. Yeah, but uh, he, like it doesn't matter to him where he's at, as long as he gets a good deal. And then talking about. Cubs being able to turn around players. Jameer Calendario is a free agent mm-hmm. this year, and the Blue Jays have expressed interest in him. I know that Whit Merrifield is a free agent as well, so maybe trying to replace him in that spot. But, yeah, lots of moving pieces. There haven't been any big signings yet, but lots of moving pieces, out of interest from clubs. They're working hard to get the, the best advantage they can. So it'll be interesting to see what goes on in the future. I think see Oscar Hernandez, I, I feel like he actually should kick a tire on him. This guy was a silver slugger at a time over there in Toronto. So the strike that so. Yeah, but I mean you could work on that. Yeah. That's, true. that's why that's why it's the offseason. Then the, these guys are working. They're playing in the uh either Dominican Winter League, the Venezuelan Winter League. Lots of baseball is still happening around the world. So don't forget about that. Even Dubai. Baseball United. I don't know if you saw that. Did they not? Bartolo Colon, all these Didi Gregorius is playing over there now. It's pretty fascinating. I'm sure they're paying that. I'm I'm sure they're paying them a pretty penny over there. So, dude, imagine playing in Dubai. I feel I've I've, I've heard great things about, you know, Dubai itself, but now playing over there, no, that's pretty, pretty fascinating. But that is all that we have for today. Obviously, like Angel said, we had to bring back what the stove is cooking up. It's warming up right now. It could be heating up soon. It could get hot real quick in a snap of a finger. But that is in for our show. Continue to follow us at Full Steam Ahead on X, Twitter, uh, TikTok as well. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, Instagram, FSA, Full Steam Ahead. Threads, of course, we're still there. You already know. And then the podcast platforms, Google, Spotify, Apple Podcast. Angel, you got anything before we sign off? No, it's just peace and thank you for listening. Yep, thank you for listening. Like we talked about before, we'll do an episode once a week. Unless something urgently happens, we could be coming up and we'll be talking about maybe the Astros signing a big free agent name or trading for a big free agent or even the new Astros manager. Who would that be? Until then, y'all have a safe and terrific throwback Thursday throwback which not really but terrific thursday um stay safe out there have a blessed weekend stay safe like i said before and say it again see you later